Good evening. That's not what I wanted. Let's see, there we go. All right. Welcome to the Living Water live stream Bible study. We will give um, people time to come in. My name is Bernardine Wormley Daniels, and it is my privilege to be able to be here with you to break open the bread of life and dig deep into the Word of God. Amen. So, share the link, invite people to join me. Um, we're going to get back into the word that we were doing on last week um, regarding what is salvation bringing salvation back. Amen. Bringing that message back to the church. We're giving people just a couple of minutes to come into the room and be with us. Um, but good evening to Canada. Hello, Kathy. Um, good evening, Loretta and Gwendolyn. Good evening to you. Praise God. Um, the notes are the same notes from the last week. So I did repost them in a new link on my page in the comment section. Um, but they're the same notes from last week. So if you... Um, if you downloaded the notes last week, um, then you've got them. Praise God. Amen. Um, and I hope that people remember that we're starting at our back at our regular time. Um, we had switched for a season while I was taking a um, New Testament Greek class. Um, but I have completed that first stage, and now I'm in the second level of that, or the next phase, I should say, not second level, but the next phase. So my time freed back up. So that's why we're back at um, um, the seven o'clock time. So hopefully people will see it and they'll remember and they'll join in. But while we're waiting, just a couple of things I wanted to um, share um, with you. Um, the one thing I wanted to let you know was Soterios Ministries, let me let me stop this music. Soterios Ministries does have an app. Um, and um, what I'm going to start doing is putting the Bible study notes into the app. Um, let me see. I want to find it. Um, well, you're not going to be able to see it good. If you have an Android or if you have Apple, you know, because I, I use Apple um, stuff, Mac, um, the, the app is available in both Android and Apple. Um, and um, I think you can, in the Apple store or the Apple app, like store, you can, it's a free app. You can go in and just put in Soterios Cyber Church, and the app will pop up. It'll be right there, and it has the Soterios logo, and then when you open the app, it has um, a link that says YouTube. If you press that, it'll take you to my immediately to my YouTube channel where you can see all the old Bible studies. They're all there for you. Um, you can click the upcoming events. It'll tell you what's happening. Like right now, just the Tuesday night Bible study and Saturdays, I have a new, um, home fellowship, the table home fellowship. Um, and it'll tell you, um, the time, um, that it meets and it'll even give you the location. Okay. All of that information is in the app. Um, it gives you a link where if you want to sow into the ministry, you can click the button for give and you can sow and 
the service that provides the giving is has bank level security so it's even more secure if you use the app giving tab than if you gave it through paypal or cash app or something like that the the app soteria's app is is actually more secure um it has a page where you can shop if i have ever have materials for you um, and then there's a button that says dr bernie's study notes if you click that it will take you to a link and oh i forgot i put it in there and it actually says salvation is so the notes for tonight are in the app you can then click on that um, it's got lots of cool stuff in it it has a connect button where you click connect you go in it gives you all kind of other links it'll tell you about you know soterios ministries how you can contact us if you want to connect on social things like facebook and youtube it gives you links for that It'll, a button for the website um, there's a button that says media where if you go into that there are a couple of messages that i have uploaded um, so that you can um, you know listen as a matter of fact there's a song that i did with my native american um, flute it was a song that the the just came out of the spirit that the lord gave me called echad it's instrumental echad is a hebrew word that means one and it was my heart crying out to the lord about wanting to be one um, with him and draw me draw me into you draw me into you lord i want to be echad or one that song is in there um so you can hear me playing my native american flute with a track um, it's a it's an awesome app. Again, if you are a an Apple person, you can go into the Apple App Store and put in Soterios Cyber Church, and it's right there. It's a free download, and it's got all that cool stuff. And you can find our schedule. You can find the notes for the Bible study. All of that. If you are an Android person, you can. It's in the Android Store as well. And I think it has the same name. I'm not, I see, I don't use Android, so, but I'm not sure. But I, I believe that's, it's in there under Soterios Cyber Church, okay? Um, so I wanted to tell you guys about that. If you don't have the Soterios app and you have a smartphone, download it into your phone and you'll have everything at your fingertips, okay? Praise God. So do that i would love to see um <clears throat> some more people download and use that app um the other thing i wanted to tell you about listen if you and good evening to my um cousin mary and my aunt mary they are viewing praise god we can get started now but before we do if you have not been watching the chosen series you just need to, okay? You can download that app. Um, also, it's the, the Chosen or it might be an Angel Studios and you can watch all the Chosen. Now, we're in season three. You would have to binge watch season one, season two and catch up, but you need to do it. I'm telling you, it is the absolute best dramatization of Jesus and the disciples that you will have ever seen. Okay. It's like a drama series. Okay. Based on, um, the word of God is called the chosen. It'll be nine, um, seasons long right now. We're in the third season. They're raising money for the other seasons. It is so good the chosen if you have not seen it if you have a smart tv you can download the app the angel studios app. And you can watch it right on your tv or if you have a smart tv you can download the app into your smartphone and share it to your tv okay all of that technology come on take advantage of the technology or you can watch it on your iPad or on your phone. I'm telling you, it will drive you into the word. It'll, 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 it'll make you open your Bible and begin to read. Absolutely incredible. Every episode gets better and better and better. Um, episode five, I think we're on five um, of season three. 
was phenomenal. There's eight episodes per season. The only downside um, to that is that after we finish episode eight, which will be like in about three weeks, we have to wait like a whole year for them to, to film and come out with episode with season four. But I'm telling you, it's incredible. So support it, so into it, buy the gear, buy the chosen paraphernalia, which all goes to support um, um, the, the series. The Chosen, Angel Studios app or The Chosen app. Just find it, download it. You will love it, okay? All right. Um, the last announcement, let's see. I told you about the Soteria Cyberchurch app download it today, okay? The notes, all the information, videos, YouTube stuff, all is on the Soterios app, okay? Um, also, if you like to read, oh man, praying like monks, living like fools, an invitation to the wonder and mystery of prayer by Tyler Staten. This is so good. I almost ordered a case of these just so that I could like stick them in people's hands. And then I was like, no, they're gonna have to get their own. <laughs> but it's so good. I'm telling you, I'm telling you it's good. Um, also, if you are a person who likes contemplative style praying or however you pray, praying the Psalms in 30 days um, compiled by Trevin Wax. Oh, you should add this to your prayer closet. All right, guys, now we're ready to jump into the word. Grab your Bible. Amen. Let me get my little space set up here. I think I have my ESV. This is my Bible that's on my Facebook page. <laughs> um, ESV, we'll, we'll, we'll use that tonight. All right, so let's pray. Welcome the Holy Spirit, and we're going to jump in. So um, uh, good evening. Let's see who came in. Renee, my aunt and my cousin came in. Uh, Gary McCray, good evening to you. Um, good evening to uh, Minister Cannon. Um, good evening to, let's see who else came in, Brenda. Um, good evening to Ruth. Who did I miss? My cousin, Linda. She's the sergeant at arms, the colonel. Oh, the she keeps everybody straight. <laughs> That's my cousin, Linda. Praise God. Um, okay, let's get started. What is salvation? Bringing salvation back. Father, thank you for this opportunity that you give us to gather across um, this region um, in various states in the United States and even across um, the bridge over into the nation of Canada. We are so blessed to be able to come together as hungry disciples of Jesus Christ, thirsting for drink water from the wells that um, flow out from under the throne of God. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, brood over each of us in the birthing position, ready to unlock revelation fresh tonight. Sow it in our hearts that we might hide it there, that we might live righteous lives and not stray from the right way, stray from the path. We want to keep our hand in the hand of the Lord and to complete this journey with you. So we bless you. We praise you, Lord. We um, do this in your name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Where's my water? Um, what is salvation? All right. Um, thought I had something. Where is it? Oh, there it is my tissue. Okay, so quick review. We, we um, first, we defined um, the word salvation. The root word is sozo, sozo, sozo. Let me get my screen right. There we go. Um, sozo. 
in the in the Greek. And basically it means to save, to deliver, to protect, to heal, preserve, to do well, to make whole, to keep safe, to rescue from danger or destruction. And I'm going to go quick because we did all of this last week. Then we talked about how salvation is deliverance from suffering. Um, and we looked at some passages of scripture. You're going to need a Bible tonight because we got lots of scripture to, to look at. Um, we, we talked about how it carries the idea of victory, health, preservation. Um, we also said that the word can also um, have to do with eternal or spiritual deliverance. Okay. And then we, we asked the question, well, what is it exactly that we are saved from? What are we saved from? Wait, let me adjust my screen. There we go. I got to make my notes bigger. There we go. Um, we are saved from wrath. We are, we are saved from God's judgment, which is real. Now, I know there are lots of people in the world that don't want to think that is real, but it is. Um, and we talked about how God does not judge us on a curve. Um, he judges us based on himself and his word, and he is his word, okay? So we looked at who does the saving. We said that only God, only God, the one God, God Almighty, he is the only one who can say, how does he save? We said, well, God has rescued us through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. He is the only means of salvation. We looked at how scripture is clear that salvation is the gracious, undeserved gift of God. And again, it is only available through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, we looked at how do we receive salvation? Well, we are saved by faith. We said first, we must hear the gospel, okay? We must hear the gospel. Then we must believe the God. We have to believe what we have heard. This is how you receive salvation. You hear the gospel. That's why it's so important that we share the gospel. The scripture says, how shall they hear without a preacher? That you, you We need to share the gospel with people on our jobs, in our homes, you know, use the, the social platforms that we have to, to um, let people know that sin is real, heaven is real, hell is real, and the only way to avoid the latter is to go through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we are reconciled to God. So you have to hear the gospel. You must believe then what you have heard. And so that causes you to repent, to change your mind about sin and about Christ. And you call on the name of the Lord. And so we talked about, um, we gave a definition of the Christian doctrine of salvation. And we said that that would be the deliverance by the grace of God. This is what salvation is. The doctrine of salvation is deliverance by the grace of God from eternal punishment for sin, which is granted to those who accept by faith God's conditions of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So then we talked about, well, how do we do that? What people look for steps. What are the steps to salvation and how we like to give people a, a, a an instruction mat. You know, we want to tell them, well, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do that. Um, and we looked at how, um, many of the things that we tell people that they have to do to be saved are actually things that happen when people get saved, <laughs> you know, um, that the Bible only presents one step to salvation. And that is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in him and you will be saved. And so, um, we, we summed up that. All people have sinned. There is no person on the planet, not one who is without sin. Everybody has sinned. And because we have sinned, we are then separated from a holy God because sin cannot abide in his presence. So when there is sin, there is separation, which is the biblical understanding of death. Okay. And so um, we said that because of his love for us, God took 
on human form, came into the earth, lived and walked among us, and died in our place. He became the substitute. Okay, we'll say more about that in a minute. So we said then that God promises forgiveness and eternal life to all who would receive by grace through faith, Jesus Christ as Savior. So you cannot earn salvation, okay? Yes, you should be baptized. Yes, you should publicly confess him. Yes, you should repent, turn away from sin. Yes, you should commit your life to um, living for him. But these are not the steps to salvation. These are the results of salvation. This is how we know that Christ is working in your life, okay? Um, and so... Um, we talked about how we're not capable of paying our own sin debt. You cannot pay your debt. It is too great. You cannot pay it. You needed Jesus to become the propitiation, which is just a fancy word that means he took your place. Okay. He's the substitute. That's what we were talking about last time, I believe when we finish that he is the propitiation. Isaiah 53, Jesus bore our sickness. He carried our pains. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Our punishment was placed on him and by his wounds, then we are healed. We are all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone. Let me give myself a little more volume. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ was punished because of us. He took our punishment. Okay. And so we looked at that. We looked at several passages of scripture that echo that same thing. And, um, we said, so salvation and forgiveness is not about following steps. It is about receiving Christ as Savior and recognizing that he has done all of the work for us. So he can, like, let's say this is the work of Christ, you know, in, in the, this water is, is the work of Christ. And he brings it to you and he shows it to you and he explains to you how if you drink this water, it will produce life cleansing, renewal. It gives your body everything that you need in order to live. And you, you, you look at it and you touch it and you say, oh, that looks refreshing, but you never receive it by, by drinking of it, taking it into yourself. If you don't, then he brought it to you and you saw it and you touched it, but you don't have it because you didn't receive it. Okay. So you have, you can't just go to, go to, <laughs> you can't just go uh, to church and sit around, you know, uh, you know, you have to actually receive him as, as savior. All right. So he did his part. We have our part. So I asked, have you received Christ as your savior? Have you received? Salvation is God's grace and you must receive him. You must receive him. I, even as we're talking, um, and you know, my phone is silenced, but it's got these alerts. And so look at this. Um, and I don't know who this young man is, but just a, a, a thing popped up on my news alerts that said Air Force football player. So he, he was in the Air Force, played for the Air Force football team. His name is Hunter Brown. He was 21 years old. They just released a news alert. He suffered a medical emergency on his way to class. And he's not, he's dead. He was a sophomore. Okay. On his way to class from, from his dorm room. And they say he collapsed. Now we could do a whole Bible study on why all of a sudden all these healthy people are collapsing, but that's a, that's another study. Let's keep going. Um, so he 21 years old and he has crossed the threshold into eternity. I pray he was ready. Have you received Christ as your savior? Are you ready? 
And so this is where we left off. It is salvation is the gift of freedom from sin that Jesus made possible by taking the punishment for our sins on the cross. And here is a wonderful example of to help you grasp, you know, what this really means. So mercy, God's mercy is when I am not given what I really deserve. Okay. That's God's mercy. So when you see Christ hanging on the cross, dying in your place, that is mercy. You're not get you. We were the ones who deserved to be there, but we are not there. He took our place. That is a picture of God being merciful. When I am not given, I'm, I'm caught, I'm guilty, but I'm not punished. Somebody took it instead. I, that's mercy. Grace is when I am given what I don't deserve. In other words, his mercy, he goes to the cross. Grace is the gift of life that he gives me. I don't deserve life. I deserved the cross, but he went in my place. That's mercy. And he gives me the opportunity to be reconciled to him through that sacrifice. If I believe it and receive it and repent, that's grace. That was worth you tuning in just that little bit right there. So look at this. Let's use the illustration of a speeding ticket. So you go barreling down the highway. Of course, not you guys. It's the people that are not viewing. They're the ones who drive above the speed limit. But let's say for just for, you know, hypothetical purposes that you're doing 85, <laughs> zipping up 14, doing 85 in a 70 mile per hour zone. And um, a police officer a state trooper, whoo, light comes on, he pulls you over. So let's look at these different levels of what you could experience in that moment. Good fortune is if you go tearing down um, 14 and you're not caught. That's just about every day for most of you. you, you you've been getting away with it. That's good, good fortune. Justice is if you're zipping down 14 doing 85, 90, and you're caught and you're given a ticket, and no need you being mad at the state trooper, that's just justice, okay? Mercy is if you're zipping up 14 doing 85 or 90, you are caught, but he doesn't give you a ticket. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna let you go today. That's mercy. Grace is if you're flying up 14, 85, 90 miles an hour, you are caught, he pulls you over, he gives you a ticket, but then he says, you know what? I'm gonna pay this for you. <laughs> that's, that's grace. He, you got caught, you got, he gave you the ticket, but he's gonna pay the fine for you. That is grace, okay? And so that's what we get. That's, that's, that's what Christ has done for us. So through this gift of God's grace, 1 John 1 and verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, if we sit with him in, our, in the quiet place and we just begin to talk to him and we tell him, Lord, you know, I, this is real. I did this, this, this. I know this is wrong. Blah, 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 blah. You confess your sin. You're not trying to hide it with someone. So if they hadn't have done such and such, no, that's you shifting the blame. No, if you just confess, this is me. This is my heart. This is what I did. That's wrong. If we confess our sins and let me, let me take that even further. You can circle that word confess in your notes and you can write the word homologeo. H-O-M-O-L-O-G-E-O, -O -O homologeo. It's a Greek word, homo meaning same, logeo meaning to say, to say the same thing as. So confession means that whatever this book says about sin, you say the same thing. Okay, that's confession. 
You say what God has said about a thing. So um, you, when you confess your sins to me, you're like, Lord, your word is right. This is what you said. This is what I did. I'm wrong. Your word is right. When we do that, it says, he who is faithful and just, he will forgive. He will release us from the penalty of our sins. Did you get that? He who is just, that word me in the Greek, <clears throat> it means to exhale, to send it forth, to release. He will release us from our sin debt because we were real and we said, Lord, I did this. I'm wrong. You, you're right. Forgive me. The scripture says he forgives us and then he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So we stand before him just as if we had never sinned. I'll take that. I'll take that, that right there. That's grace. That's mercy and grace all rolled up into one package. I'll take that. I don't know about you. So this is one of the most important promises of scripture. And it gives us freedom and hope for the future. Okay. Um, I know there are, um, you know what? Let me see if I can remember again. I thought that I had turned off these alerts. Um, let me turn on, do not disturb. Yeah. Off every day. It's supposed to be. Okay. How do I turn it on? I want it to turn. I want it to turn on. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I think I turned it on. I hope so. But if that thing is still beeping. I hate it when it does that while we're in the middle of class. Okay, uh, where was I? Um, so this is one of the most important promises of scripture, okay? It gives us freedom and it gives us hope for the future. God is faithful and he daily invites us to find new life in response to that faithfulness. And I'm telling you, people, uh, this is important. It's just like I was telling you this, this news alert popped up young man, 21 years old. Can you imagine what his family is going through right now? 21 years old. That's tragic. But what would be an even greater tragedy is if he crossed that line, um, not having been reconciled with God through Christ, that is an even greater tragedy. Okay. And so, um, if God's invitation daily to find new life, if it sounds too good to be true, um, if it, 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 it sounds, you know, too easy for some people, you know, and even though it may seem too good for words or completely different than anything you've ever experienced, it is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the beauty and the mystery of grace, the beauty and the mystery of grace, you and I receiving forgiveness that we don't deserve. The beauty and the mystery of grace is when we receive forgiveness that God knows we don't deserve, but he extends it to us. All we gotta do is receive it. Salvation is for something, not just from something, okay? So sometimes it seems like the Christian life is all about being saved and then helping other people get saved. And, but when we go a little deeper, you know, we find out that we're being, that, that we are saved and we are being saved. It means that we are saved not only from something, we're, we're saved from our sins, but we're also saved for something, okay? And so it is important to realize we're saved from our sins, but we are saved for something as well. We are saved so that we can carry out the purpose for which God has us on earth. Every single one of us, regardless of who we are, 
regardless of how old we are, what our family background is, if you are still breathing, there is a purpose. There is a purpose that God has for you on the earth. I don't know about you, but I want to fulfill that purpose. I pray about that, you know, often when it comes up just in my, in my heart. I pray, Lord, I want to live until I have completed the purpose for which you called me and for which you put me here. And here's that purpose. You and I have the same purpose. Now, the way by which we might carry it out is very diverse, but we share a common purpose. And that is to share the good news of God's grace. We are to share the good news of God's grace. And regardless of who you are, where you are, where you work, what you do, that's your purpose to share the good news. If you're a barber, have your own barbershop. You, you, you're there to be a light and a witness. You are to be different. You are to be a peculiar people, a, a, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. You are to be different from the world around you. You are to carry the grace and the compassion and the wisdom and the, you know, the power of the one who saved you. Okay. And so we're to share that. We can share it overtly. We can share it subtly. We can just live it and walk it to people say, man, you know, there's just something different about you. And you say, oh, well, let me tell you who it is. Okay. We are to be the hands and the feet of Christ in this world. And we are to show God's love through our lifestyle and our actions. Listen, and you and I, we have to learn how to be stealth. You know, um, people don't have to know what we're doing. I've shared this with you before, but when I was a young seminary student, just in my twenties, like 23, 24 years old, and um, I had a mentor who was a minister in, I want to say the Lutheran church, and she had a healing ministry. And she used to tell me, are you aware that the anointing just kind of flows from you? She was aware of the presence of God, you know, on my life and, and in me and through me. And I had gone to seminary out of a Pentecostal holiness church. So I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I believed in fasting and prayer and all that kind of stuff. And, but I wasn't aware that the anoint that I was carrying the anointing that was tangible to people that, you know, had a sensitivity. So she told me years ago, she said, you have to get in the habit of touching people. She said, they don't have to know what you're doing. Just touch them and release God's grace. They don't have to know what you're doing. You listen, we, we can pray stealthily. Okay. We can pray in our spirit. They don't have to know what you're doing. Just release his kingdom, grace, his love and his compassion. I'm going to reclaim that. I'm going to reclaim that. I think that there have been some, some tragic things that have happened, some traumatic things that have happened in my life that have kind of caused me to pull back. And so I don't reach out as much. I tend to be more of a stand at a distance, but I will in, in, in 2023, I'm going to try to change that and get back to what, um, that minister told me years ago, just begin to touch people and release God's power. Prayer. They don't even have to know you're doing it. You could just say, hey, how are you? And as you touch them, you're releasing the anointing. Okay? Because we are his hands and his feet. We're to show God's love through our lifestyle and our actions. So salvation is for something, not just from something. And salvation is a process, not a one-time event. So we receive salvation through Jesus Christ, but that's not the end of the process of being saved. That's just the beginning. It is the beginning of a lifelong process of being continually shaped into the people that God intends us to be. So I ought to be a little more saved today than I was yesterday. And tomorrow I should be even more saved than I am today. You know, there should be a continual molding. Tomorrow I should look a little bit more like Jesus. <laughs> okay. Whether you can see it or not, okay? 
long as he can see it, praise God. So this means becoming more and more like Christ, all right? Something we do in grateful thanksgiving for our salvation. When I get saved, listen, that's the whole idea of discipleship, that when we become disciples, we want to look like him, we want to walk like him, and talk like him, and act like him, and love like him, and heal like him, and release the Father's heart of love like him, okay? We want to become more and more like Christ. And listen, beloved, that doesn't happen with you not spending time with him. We have to spend time, because whoever or whatever we give our time to, that is what we become like, okay? And so as we become more like Christ, God works through us to share Christ's love and his grace with the world. So salvation is the free gift that God offers to us. It's a free gift that he offers to us. So our lives lived in a manner that pleases him is our gift back to him. It's the way we say thank you. So he gives us the free gift of salvation. We believe it, we receive it. And then my life, I begin to live it in a manner that is pleasing to him. And that is my offering back to him. That's my way of saying thank you for the immeasurable gift of salvation. Come on, guys. That was a good place to say amen. So let's look at it. Let's look at these past, present, and future dim dimensions of salvation. Let's look at it real quick. Let's go into Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's see what it says. I'm reading from the ESV, all right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So that's in the past. But by grace, you have been saved. Even when we, you were dead, in, unless you're watching me tonight and you're not saved. <laughs> but if you are saved, then this, your salvation, it's a, this is something that has happened. You were dead in trespasses, but he made you alive together with Christ. Okay. Then skip over to verse number eight for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing. It is the gift of God. So by grace, you have been saved. Matter of fact, you can take past all the way back to the cross. So at the cross, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, the burdens of my heart rolled away. The, the, at the cross is where we were first saved. Now it may have taken time to catch up to what he did in the past, but you were saved at the cross in the past. Okay, you guys with me? All right, so now let's look at it in the present. Go over to Peter. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. So we receive that right now. The, 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 the outcome of my faith, I receive that. That's the salvation of my soul. And I receive it right now in the present. Flip back to first, uh, well, let's stop in Philippians since we got to pass Philippians to get to Corinthians. You're going backwards in your Bible. Flip back to Philippians 2. And verse number 12, uh, ba, 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 ba. therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, 
working out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's what we do every day. When we get up, we work out our salvation because we're supposed to live in it in the present. So I'm working it out. I'm working it out. <laughs> oh boy, I just had I, I just had a thought. I went somewhere in my head. You know, I was imagining that somebody did something ignorant, you know, and really rude, something slap worthy. <laughs> Maybe somebody does something that the old you would have slapped them for, okay? But the new you just smiles and says, God bless you. And somebody else says to you, girl, you gonna let them get away with that? And you say, yes, because I'm working out my salvation. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. I'm working it out with fear and trembling every day, okay? So now look back at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. <laughs> For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So to those of us who are being saved in the present and on into the future, every day we're in the process. We were saved at the cross. We are being saved in the present. And let's look at the future. Since we're in Corinthians, just stay there. Go over to chapter 3 and verse 15. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Will be puts it in the future tense. So we, we were saved at the cross. We are being saved in the, in the, um, in the um, present and we will be saved in the future. So it is a something that happens in time and it continues until it is culminated, you know, ultimately with his return. Um, flip over to 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5. Um, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Again, that's a future, speaking of a future event. And flip back uh, one more book to Romans 13. And let's look at verse 11. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. That's a word for today. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So Paul speaks of salvation as something that occurred in the past at the cross, something that is being worked out in our life every day, and something that will be ultimately worked out in the um, future um, on the, at the day of the Lord. Okay? Um, wait, let me see. Let me make sure I said that right. Uh then when we first believe salvation is near to us now. Yeah, then we first believe. Okay, um, so let's let's go on and look at some other key passages. Uh, let's see, Romans 6. These are passages that we want to consider when we talk about bringing salvation back because I'm telling you, people do not think that they need to be saved. And there are even people in the church that don't really get it. We, if all you have to do is talk to people, people think that heaven is everybody's default location. And by that, I mean a lot of people. Um, a lot of people um, believe that um, just because you're living and breathing that you are going to make it into heaven. Okay, what is Darren saying to me? For the preaching of the cross is to them um, that perish, but to, uh, to us which are saved. It is the power of God. You know, um, I'm going to bet, let's see, that's the King James I'm going to bet that the ESV captured the Greek better than the King King. I'm, I'm, let me see. 1 Corinthians 1 um, and verse 18. You're going to make me look at it in the Greek. 
um, to us who are being saved. Yeah, that puts it in the presence and it continues. Whereas, ah, uh, the King James, unto us which are saved. I guess that's a present tense too, but probably the... Um, um, if it's a participle in the Greek, it's, it's an ing type word. And so the being is a better definition. Um, I tend to think I don't have time to, to look it up. And I don't have a, a Greek New Testament in front of me. They're in my other room. All I got is, is John, John's epistle. But yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with the ESV. Those unto us which are saved. Um, I would have to look at it in the Greek, but I think the ESV probably captured it better. All right, Romans 6. So, for the wages of sin is death. In other words, the, what, the, the, the salary that we, the wage that we earn for being rebellious um, uh, to God and, and violating his word, unrepentant, is death. And remember, death from a biblical perspective means separation. So, um, oh, uh, if let's, let's say my little pen case is inside the case is heaven. Sin, this is like relationship with God. Sin takes you outside the case. And the Bible describes that as being dead. Okay, it, death is more than physically your body going back to the dust. It means separation. Your spirit separates from your body or you are separated from God. So you can go to the mall at Christmas time, jam packed full of people and a whole bunch of them folk are the living dead because they live out here as opposed to in here. Okay, so just to give you a, a, a picture, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, oh, let me get that off of my notes. Okay. All right. So, um, those of us who give themselves, those who give themselves to sin, they will die physically and eternally. That's what I was just saying. Whereas people who give themselves to Christ are assured of eternal life. The wages implies that the punishment for sin is what you have earned, that you're only going to receive what you have earned. You're, you're going to get what you deserve, okay? The free gift is the opposite of what we deserve. And it fits Paul's earlier emphasis on justification by grace alone, through faith um, alone, where we trust Christ, okay? He is our, he's our um, substitute. So the free gift is the opposite of what we deserve. So Romans 1, I mean Romans 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's in the book. I didn't make it up. You can't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what it says. So, and that that's that's across the board, regardless of how old, young, how rich, how poor, nationality, demographics, all of that. That it, it applies to everybody. Okay. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, this is Paul talking to the believers at Philippi. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. One of the things that I'm convinced that we need, maybe I'll, I'll do a teaching on it coming up maybe after this. I'll do a teaching on um, um, the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? You know, um, because we lost it but we need to get it back, <laughs> okay? The fear of the Lord. There are certain passages of scripture, I don't know how people read them without there being like a holy 
awe or reverence for like, oh, you know, this is serious stuff. So um, the Philippians have obeyed Christ um, in the past and they should, Paul is telling them they should continue to do so as they work out their salvation with fear and trembling. So it's a day to day thing. You can't just get saved on some obscure day 20 years ago and you've been living like the devil since then and think you're gonna go sliding into heaven. It don't work like that. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, see? It's they cannot be content. We cannot be content with past glories, but we need to demonstrate our faith daily. We need to demonstrate our faith daily, okay? Um, day by day as we nurture our relationship with God. It's a day-to-day -day walk. It's just like, um, oh, it's like with any, any type of covenant. You can't get married, go on a honeymoon. Oh, I love you, baby, baby, baby. I love you. And then a month later, you know, I'm sick of you. You need, you want to go and do what you want to do. No, that's not how covenant works. You got to work at it day by day for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, um, forsaking all others, keeping yourself only unto the other, the, your spouse, till death do you part. That's how covenant works. So we're supposed to work at it day by day and demonstrate our faith day by day as we nurture our relationship with God. You got to work at it, okay? While God's justice is a cause for sober living, it is not as though Paul wants the Philippians to be anxious. He doesn't want them to be nervous. Oh, God going to squash you like a bug. That's, <laughs> that's not what he's saying. He's rather, it is God's love and enabling grace that sees us through. But we do need to know that we serve a holy God. Okay, he is a holy God and he does have a wrath. And so it is God who works in us. It is his love and enabling grace that allows us to work out our salvation day by day. So we love him, but we honor and show reverence for him as well. So um, they can rejoice in God's empowering presence, even as they work hard and living responsible Christian lives. So just that's what Paul was telling the church at Philippi. And that's what he's saying to us as well. We can rejoice in God's empowering presence, even as we are, because sometimes it is hard work, particularly if you're surrounded by people that get on your nerves. <laughs> if you are surrounded on a day-to-day -day basis by people that irritate your soul, then, you know, it, it, it's, it's work. You need the Holy Ghost. Okay, I'll, I'll just tell you. If, you. if you go out your house or, or at any time and get in your car and drive anywhere, you're going to run into crazy people. Okay, they're out there. They're on the road. Okay, so we got to learn how to be responsible in our Christian life. Sometimes we forget. I have, I have moments. I had a moment on my way to, to the church today. I had a staff meeting. <clears throat> Going up Telegraph, made that little left turn to get onto the Jeffries Freeway. And it was at least three crazy people in other cars just driving. Like, How can you not see me? I have a big red Ford F-150 4x4 crew sport truck. It's red. You can't help but see it. It's a big red Ford truck, okay? You can't say you didn't see me. People just driving ignorant. I, I did have a moment, okay? I, I had a moment. I have to repent <laughs> because for a split second, whoo, I almost lost my salvation, but I, but I worked it out. Come on, tell somebody, work it out. I'm telling you, <laughs> that's a word from the Lord, okay? While Philippians 2 and verse 12 may seem to suggest salvation by works, Paul doesn't teach salvation by works. Um, all you have to do is read uh, chapter um, 3, start in verse 2, and work all the way down 
um, through to verse 11, you'll see he does not believe in um, salvation by works, but instead works are, is a result of your salvation, okay? In Philippians 2 and verse 12, Paul means salvation in terms of progressively coming to experience all the aspects and benefits of salvation, okay? It's a process. We have to grow in our walk and we grow in our faith. We work it out day by day, okay? So the Philippians continued obedience is an inherent part of working out their salvation. And it's the same thing for us. Day by day, we work on it. We work at it, okay? And we grow in the things of God. Um, so this passage demonstrates that these works are the result of God working in us, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. As we yield to him, he will work in us and he'll keep us from getting caught up in road rage on the, on the streets. Instead, we'll learn how to bless people as they almost hit our, our truck or our car or whatever you're driving. Even the desire to will to do what is good comes from God. Even the desire to serve him, the desire to work out your salvation, the desire to love your neighbor as yourself, that comes from God. But he works in us to generate actual choices of good so that the desires result in action. So he's working in us. When we get into bad situations or, or challenging situations, let the Holy Spirit work in you to help you to make the right choice to desire choices that line up with your salvation, okay? All right, let's move on to John 14 and verse 6. This is the passage where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus identifies himself as the one way to the Father, that you, you cannot just pick, pick a route, pick a path, any path. No, it doesn't work like that. You cannot say, well, I believe that Christianity is a way and that Jesus was just a very wise prophet um, who had achieved um, the Buddha state. Um, uh, no. Mm -mm. You, you can't run around saying, I'm a Chrislamabood, which crazy people do. A Christian Muslim Buddhist. No, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. There, oh, <laughs> I almost said the wrong thing. There's no such thing as a, as a Chrislamabood. There is a such thing as foolish people, but there's not a such thing as a Chrislamabood. You either a Christian or you're not. Okay. Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus, as the one way to the Father, fulfills what the Old Testament symbols and teachings um, um, demonstrate for us and show the exclusiveness of God's claim, okay? Um, and you see this type of these, these typologies in the Old Testament, in Exodus 26 and verse 33, you see a curtain barring access to God's presence from everybody except for the Levitical high priest. There was only one person who could come back there and there was only one way for him to get back there. It's a type and a shadow of Jesus being the, the way. If you want to get back behind that curtain to the Father, there's only one way to get back there. You must come through the great high priest who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you see a rejection of human inventions as a means to approach God. Leviticus 10 and verse 2, you cannot just decide how you're going to get to God. No, he has already written it. That's why you need to be reading the Bible with me this year. Leviticus 10, remember this is the story of Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu were priests. They were the sons of Aaron, okay? So they were part of the priesthood, but look at what they did. Each one took a censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and off offered what the Bible calls unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. Verse 2, 
and fire came out from before the Lord and fried them. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Fire came out from the altar and consumed them and they died before the Lord. So when you dig in it, when you dig into that narrative, you find that, see, the people had come out of Egypt and some of them brought Egypt with them. They had been in bondage in Egypt for years. And so God had given a prescription, a prescription for how to make the incense that was offered and the way in which the priest was supposed to do it. And you had to do it that way. You could not just say, well, I like this flavor incense and I'm going to mix it with a little bit of this and I'm going to offer it the way I want to. Okay, you, you do that. You do that. No, crispy critters, they were fried. Did, did, that's Leviticus 10 because they had this human invention about a way to approach God. And I'm telling you, listen, it is too late for the world to be playing that game with God. The, listen, the time is short. The hour is much later than it was when Jesus walked the earth. We are in those times when, as in the days of Noah, listen, beloved, you are there. We are there, okay? And so we don't have time to be tripping on the dark side. You don't have time to be designing your own route to heaven. I'm telling you, you got to come this way. See, you got to come by means of Christ. See, so the scripture shows that God, God gave a way to approach him and we have to follow his way. And the Bible, Jesus in John 14, verse six, I am the way and the truth and the life. See, regardless of how well-meaning people might be, if they're wrong, they're wrong. See, okay, so um, again, we see another typology in God choosing Aaron <clears throat> and his household <clears throat> alone to represent Israel before him. Um, so Jesus is the only way to God. That, that's the point, you know. Um, look real quick, Acts chapter 4. Come on, we, you, you got to get in a book. Read it for yourself. Don't let somebody sell you a, a bill of goods because it has eternal consequences. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Look, look at this, Acts 4 verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else for there is, there is no other name under heaven, given among men, by which we must be saved. Okay? There's no, there's no other way. This is Peter and John before the council. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to share this word with them. He tells them, listen, there's no other way. There's no other, there's no other name by which you, you can be saved. Okay? That's the book. Only Christ alone, Christ alone, Christ alone provides access to God. So Jesus, as the truth, fulfills the teaching of the Old Testament, and he reveals the true God. He reveals the true God. Let, let's look at, oh, go back to John. Let's just look at a few of these passages of scripture, um, just so you can see it for yourself. Uh, John 1 and verse uh, 14, John 1 and verse 14, and the word, the word from, from verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and then look at verse 14, and the word, the one that was God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And drop down to verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God, the um the only God who is at the Father's side. That's talking about Jesus, who are at the came out of the Father's bosom. He has made him known. He the, the, in the Greek it says Jesus is the exegesis. He is the 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 description. He's the 
um, unfolding. He is the unveiling of the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because he and the Father are one. Okay. Flip over to John 5. I, I'm just, I think it's important for us to look at it because of the time in which we live. This is not a popular message. You have churches that don't even believe this today. You got denominations that are sliding into the darkness. They are doing exactly what the Bible says they would do. They are turning away from the truth. They are heaping onto themselves teachers that'll tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear because they tipping and dipping and slipping and living in sin. So they will compromise the word of God, wanted to say what it does not say. And listen, I know that people think that it's like an ultra geeky thing, you know, for me to like do the, 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 the Greek and the Hebrew. I had it when I was a seminary student, but I want to be able to take it deeper. I want my understanding and my revelation in it to be deeper. So I went through that arduous six, seven month <laughs> New Testament Greek class that I just finished. And right now we are reading in um, the, um, we're reading um, John's epistle to uh, John's epistle. And I'm telling you to read it, to be able to read it in, in its original form so that you don't lose all the nuances in translation. I'm willing to pay that price so that I can find those pearls and those nuggets and share it with you. And I'm telling you that Jesus is the only way. Look at John 5 and verse 33. John 5 and verse 33. You don't have to believe me. Let's see what the book says. You sent to John and he has borne witness to the truth. And so that's talking about um, John bore witness about Jesus. Jesus is the truth. Okay. And so um, Jesus alone is the life who fulfills the Old Testament promise of life given by God. He says it, he says it himself that, that John 11, we in John, we might as well flip over to 11, John 11 verses 25 and 26. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He said to, to um, one of um, Lazarus' sisters. And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. That was the right answer, okay? What about you? Do you believe this? What do you say about Jesus? Who is he to you? Is he a way? Is he just a, a, a interesting prophet? Um, is he one of the paths into heaven? What, what do you say? See, he is the only way, the only way. And he alone can provide access to God. He is the truth, the truth. And Jesus alone is life. He has life in himself. Listen, there's a lot of scripture passages in these notes. I invite you, I exhort you, don't just believe it because I'm saying it. Get your Bible out. Open your Bible. Look up the passages of scripture. Read it for yourself. And, and compare these things, you know, one to another. What does the Bible really say? Jesus alone is the life. And thus he is able to confer eternal life to all those who believe in him. One of the most quoted passages, or most memorized passages of scripture, John 3, 16. For God loved, we're going to look at it in a minute. I think it's one of our verses. So I'll quote it in a way that you have it remembered. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not be excluded perishing. This is perishing. This is the kingdom in here. You come in 
through the door that's labeled Jesus. Jesus, that's how you get in. Perish to perish means you out here. Skipping around out here. But here's life in here. If you're not in here, you are perishing. And the only way to get in here is through Jesus Christ. Okay? That's, that's period. So this is another I am saying that makes a claim to deity. Let's look at Romans 4. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God for salvation. What? The gospel, the good news concerning what? Jesus. The, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone. Did it stop right there? It says to everyone who, who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Greek is a generic reference that refers to Gentiles. That's you and I. Okay, so I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone. The sentence doesn't stop at everyone like a lot of universalists want you to believe. No, it says to everyone who believes. If you do not believe, and of course believe means what? That you change, you change, you repent, you change your mind. And you live according to the book. You can't say, I believe, and you continue to live like the world. No, 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 no. <laughs> nay, nay. <laughs> you, that doesn't work. That means that you are not believing. The scripture tells us to look for fruit. If, if you say you believe, but the fruit dangling from your tree is rotten, then you're not believing. And it's time we got back to it. Listen, I... I I'd be willing, if I was a betting person, I'd be willing to bet that my Aunt Mary is over there saying amen. <laughs> I'm here to tell you because she'll tell you. You better stop playing games. This ain't no game. This is not a game. People are leaving here of all ages. This young man, 21 years old, on his way to class from his dorm room, football player. That means he was in impeccable shape military football player, Air Force, drop dead, 21, thinking he's got decades to go and gone. So listen, young people, if you, listen, this ain't no game for you. It, when I was young, I'm trying to tell you, I did stuff that now I think about and I, my heart weeps. I weep for the severity of the sin and for the extreme grace and mercy that God extended to me. And I didn't die while I was over there. I, sometimes I am overwhelmed by his mercy and his grace and his patience, his long suffering. Okay. But we cannot be playing games with God. We, we cannot be playing games with God. We must change our heart. We Listen, beloved, you are running out of time. The tomorrow is not promised. Paul explains why he is so eager to preach the gospel everywhere. He says the gospel is the saving power of God in which the righteousness of God is revealed. See? And so um, uh, the, the believers, some of them... Um, particularly those at the church in Rome, you know, because uh, because of Rome's size and, and and strength, there were some people who you know um, were 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 hesitant, you know, like to share the message. But Paul said, "Listen, we don't have to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, this message carries power. It's the power that brings people salvation. They won't get saved if they don't hear." Um, the Jew first indicates the priority of Jews in salvation history since their election is God's people, but it doesn't exclude us to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. The, the, oh, that's, that's you and I. So the message was for them and for us, for them and for, is for everybody, okay? Let's look real quick. John 1, verses 12 and 13. Go back to John chapter 1. Verses 12 and 13. 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But to all, now, now when, when you read scripture, you have to ask yourself, what is conspicuous in its absence from the text? Or what, not only what the text says, but what does it not say, okay? So when you read this, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now you have a lot of folk running around who want to say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Not so, not so. I did, I have a whole Bible study on that. For those of you who are Bible teachers or whatever out there, I have notes I could share with you. I did a, a study. Is there a difference between being the creation of God and a child of God? Ch children of God are people that have been born, a begotten. There's a difference between being created by God and being born of God, okay? And so look at what is conspicuous in its absence from the text. It, but to all, notice that it says who did receive him and who believe. If, if you take that, it doesn't say, but to all, he gave the right to become the children of God. That's not what it says. It says to all who received him and who believed in his name, he gave the right. So there's a, I, receive him implies not merely intellectual agreement with some facts. Well, yeah, you know some stuff about, about Jesus. You know, no, you have to do more than know about him. You have to welcome him into your heart and submit your life to him. You have to live in a personal relationship with him. And I don't care if that's not a popular message. It is true. It's true. Okay. We must receive him. You got to do more than, than intellectual assent. When I was a very young 20 something year old wrestling with my call to, it, into ministry, tipping and dipping and struggling with all kinds of things and running from God and yet reaching for him with the other hand, reaching for the world with one hand and for him with the other. And, um, and I remember that Sunday when I had that encounter with him where I heard the clear, distinct, um, shake, shake you to the core, audible voice of God. Christmas Sunday, December 25th, 1983. I was 23 years old. And he spoke to my heart and he confirmed the call on my life. He, he rebuked me. He said, you have been doubting me. Stop doubting me. I called you into my ministry. I called you because I see in you something that I can use. And one of the things that he said to me that I'll never forget, he said, you will meet and you will see people, professors, theologians, pastors who know all about me. He said, but they don't know me. And he said, I'm going to make you an exception to that. And I hold him to it. I pray that all the time, Lord, I don't want to have all this information and no revelation or no relationship. I, I you said you would make me an exception. You, you promised me that I would know you for real, not just know about you. Come on. There's a difference. Okay. There's a difference. Receive him implies welcoming and submitting to him. Are you submitting your life to him? Are you in a personal relationship with him? Is he your Lord? Man, I could teach about that too. That's why he said, um, um, why do you say, why do you, Lord, 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 you're always calling me Lord, Lord, and you won't do what I say. So listen, come on. That's why we, I gave, it's on my Facebook page. Scroll back. You'll find a copy of a chronological um, order for reading through the New Testament. You can join me in reading through the New Testament chronologically. And you can see what he said for yourself, okay? Um, that's what I would do if I was you. So you have to receive him. You have to believe in him. That means you put your trust in him. 
<clears throat> he becomes your Lord and Savior. You trust him. You trust his word. See, not only who received him and believed in his name, that refers to all that is true about him. His name represents the totality of his person, all that he is, the, <clears throat> his integrity, his strength, his truth, his name is encapsulated in, in all of that, okay? And so, um, receive, but to all who receive him, circle receive, who believed in his name, circle believe, he gave the, in his name, his name, this, his, his integrity, his, his, his character, okay, um, the totality of that. <clears throat> he gave the right, that is the word exousia, that's the name of the, the church that we planted years ago, exousia. It means right, might, ability, power, authority. So to those who receive him, who believe in his name, he gives the authority, the power, the ability to become day by day by day children of God. Each day you look more and more like him, see? Born not of blood. People say, no, there's something different about you. They can tell that it's, it's, it's not a physical thing. Born not of the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but of God. See? All right? It's God's supernatural work. So this extends the possibility of becoming God's children to everybody, even us. And, and you know, to not only Jews, but to Gentiles, that's you and I. To all who believed, he gave the right. He gave the right. It indicates that saving faith precedes becoming members of God's family through adoption as his children. Well, let's look at it real quick. Oh, we got like a couple minutes. Now. Hold that thought, hold that thought, and look at John 3. Remember, he's talking to Nicodemus, who is a uh, like a seminary educated religious ruler. He's like doctoral level, you know, a D men or PhD doctoral level um, theologian. Okay, Reli ruler in Israel, and he tells him, "Look at this, John three three through eight. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above." It's translated born again, but in the Greek, it really says born from above. He cannot see, he cannot perceive, he cannot comprehend the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, we'll, we'll pick that up next week, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So something has to happen, a divine transaction. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born of the spirit, see? You're not gonna get into heaven just because you was born in the flesh. You, or you're on the planet, you must be born of the spirit, okay? Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born from above or you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. So, when, so you must be born into God's family. You must become his child. You're not his child just because you're breathing. That is theologically incorrect. It is a misconception and it is a lie that people tell themselves so that they can skip and trip and dip in sin, doing what they want to do, how they want to do it, when they want to do it, with no repercussions. And then they think when they take their last breath, they're going to go sliding into heaven because they think they're a good person. That's not what the word says. See, you must be born from above. You must be born again. And you can through Jesus Christ. The good news is he bore your sins. He's your substitute. He took the penalty for all the stuff that you and I have done so that we can receive the free gift 
of eternal life. All you got to do is believe it, receive it, come on, and enter in. All right, I'm out of time. Um, we'll pick it up with number six next time, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. I'm out of time. I'm never out of word. But um, I just want to exhort you, if you don't know him, call on him today. Call him, just say, Lord, you know, I need you. And be, sit with him. Begin to tell him what's wrong in your life. Tell him where you're missing it. Tell him that you need some help. And ask him to help you. Ask him to come in. And I guarantee you that he will. My name is Bernadine Wormley Daniels. You've been listening to the Living Water Livestream Bible Study. And it is my privilege to sit with you and share the word of God. We all need a savior. We all need a savior. And we are so blessed to be able to receive Jesus Christ as such. God bless you and I'll see you next time. Take care.